Greetings and welcome to Match Play. Ray Adams here at the beautiful Kierlin Golf Resort in Scottsdale, Arizona. We want to thank them for hosting us today for this special edition of Match Play TV. And today I am joined by two-time U.S. Open winner, by a Players' Championship winner, and also an eight-time PGA Tour winner, two-time Champions Tour winner, two-time Ryder Cupper. We could go on and on and on, and you know who I'm talking about, Lee Jansen. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. You know, of all the many, many, many people I've had on the shows, both radio, television, over the many, many years I've been doing this, I've never, I've never interviewed you, I don't think, any one time for either radio or TV, and I don't know how we missed each other, because I know we've been in a lot of the same events together. Yeah, um, well, like I said, uh, I've just, you weren't trying hard enough, I that, guess, because that's right. you know, I'm not that easy. Yeah, that's right, that's right. You know, Lee, I, I've, got to, I've got to start at the beginning, and the beginning is you were born in Austin, Minnesota. Now, you were only there a few years before your family moved you into Florida. But what's up with Austin, Minnesota? Uh, they call it Spam Town. Hormel Meats is the kind of one of the big, the big employer there in this small Midwestern town in southern Minnesota. But Tom Lehman, who you're playing a match against also, and your longtime friend, also from Austin, Minnesota. Yes. Tell me about Austin. Do you remember anything about it at all? I have no memory of Austin whatsoever. <laughs> uh, my brothers are a little older, so they at least were there and have memories of it. Um, and unfortunately for my oldest brother, he's a Vikings fan. Oh. So because of it. But I, I was not there long enough to get any affiliations or alliances with any sports teams. And we went to New Jersey, then we went to Maryland, then we went to Florida. Yeah. Well, obviously in Florida, and that's where you've pretty much been. Uh, junior golfer in Florida age 15 you win your first junior golf tournament you'd played a lot of other sports I, i'm told tell me a little bit about those years after that first junior win at 15 and then going on in to florida southern uh, college where you became not only the medalist but you became uh, the national champs that year in 1986 tell me about going to a small college in florida right well we got to florida and that's really when i was introduced to the game i played maybe once or twice in maryland but the only golf course we had anywhere near us was a nine-hole executive course. So I wasn't going to learn how to play championship golf on that course. So nope. we, we moved to Florida, joined the club. Uh, my summers were open because baseball was played during the school year, not during the summer, like in Maryland. So when summer came along and baseball ended, um, my parents signed me up for the junior clinic, and I had some friends that were there, and they invited me to play golf, and I was terrible. But I liked it. You so started being was, terrible. Oh, yeah, I was... I mean, I'd shoot 130 for 18 holes. <laughs> well, and that was I probably, can do that. <laughs> that was probably a few tees up, too. So lost a lot of golf balls and, you know, started playing junior golf, the greater Tampa junior golf. And I can remember even shooting 101 and 99 at age 14. Um, and then a year later, shooting under par and winning a junior term. So there was a rapid improvement. What happened in that year as a junior teenage golfer that you did go from being average and like everybody else to all of a sudden shooting under par. What happened? Uh, well, I see it all the time. Amateurs who have played their whole lives, but they've done the same thing their whole lives. They've installed habits that aren't good, and they can't improve their golf game because they haven't changed their habits. So, you know, when you're young, you have a chance to change your habits pretty quickly. So I got good instruction, um, and it was simple stuff. My uh, posture and stance were just terrible. Posture? So, yeah, so just get lined up correctly, get all your body parts aimed in the right direction. Um, and then work on swinging on plane. So, Were your parents surprised over the next few years at how you literally ascended to being a national champion and then going pro in 1986? I mean, did that surprise them or was it just, an, a, gra a, just a natural progression? Um, I think there was some surprise there. Um, my dad uh, actually warned me or tried to warn me because I had, um, you know, I was very excited about trying out for our high, high school golf team, which was really good. It, they won the district virtually every year, so making the high school golf team was going to be a pretty good feat in Lakeland. So he was just trying to tell me the odds of making the high school team were long, and then playing college golf were even longer, and then pro golf was, like, virtually impossible. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do it then. Yeah. Um, you know, going back real quickly, just for the viewers, tell, tell the viewers, the amateur viewers, what can they do to change their habits, even though they may be into their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s? Can it be done? Can you change your habits? I think so, yes. How uh, do you do it? 
Uh, well, it's going to take a little bit of work. So if you're if you can only get work. to the course once a week, it's going to be hard. But you know there are, there are ways to do uh, drills maybe in your office um, or at home. I know there's a lot of people out there that love golf and will do just about anything. That's why they keep buying these uh, swing aids on TV and and buying the new latest greatest clubs. What about finding a great coach and just yeah. sticking with them and I, working through it? That would be good good idea. You all could, right. You could uh, whatever you budget for all your golf expense for a year. Maybe take half of that and get some lessons. It's not a bad idea. Local PGA professional. Yeah, that's what we need to do. And you can work on simple stuff too. Um, and there's and there's great options on social media. Mike Bender, who I go to, um, he has, does a great job on his Instagram site okay. with drills showing students um, things that they can do to get out of bad habits. So um, I I use this example a lot: tuning the piano. So when the tuner comes to a piano that hasn't been tuned in forever, he doesn't just put it back to where it's supposed to be. He goes all the way past that because it reverts back. Does and it? That, and that is a lot of the problems in the golf swing is you have habits, and you can't just like, okay, I need to swing more inside out. you got to exaggerate it to really undo an over-the-top move or other really? things. Really? So, never knew that. So you Great know. advice from Lee Jansen, U.S. Open. Um, you know, Lee, when we come back in a moment, I've got to talk to you about turning pro in 1986, going to the tour, and we're going to do that, so just stay right here with us, and when we come back, Lee Jansen and I are going to talk about getting him on the PGA Tour. We'll be back with more match play right after these messages. Are you an E or a C? Both have Ridgeback. These are loaded with tech. Which one are you gaming? Definitely E for me. It's just so forgiving. I'm definitely an E. C is for Cheka. What else? C is for kill it. C is me. Low spinning bombs. So, are you an E or a C? Hmm. I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. We're like any normal family. We just get shorter wait times because we buy and book online at discounttire.com. So easy. Which gives us more time for things like... Oh, come on, Mom. <laughs> Ready? And it's all thanks to Kyle. <laughs> Thank you. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at discounttire.com. Let's get you taken care of. You've heard me talk about Squares Golf Shoes and how they help you hit the golf ball further. And many of you are saying, oh, come on, Faldo, give us a break. How is that possible? But yes, they do. And it's proven with science. What we noticed with the Square Shoes was the shoe keeps the pressure in a more stable fashion towards inside of the trail heel, allowing pressure to get to the lead side, generating much more club and speed and distance gain. Visit squares.com. Change your shoes, change your game. Squares, the distance golf shoe. Now back to Match Play with your host, Ray Adams. All right, greetings and welcome back to Match Play with Lee Jansen today here at Kierlin Golf Resort in Scottsdale, Arizona. Thank them again. What a beautiful, beautiful place and a gorgeous day today, Lee. And thanks again for being with me today. All right, 1986, after your national championship at Florida Southern, you decided, I'm going to be a pro. But it took you a few years on the PGA Tour to figure out how to win. Take me from 1986 to, I believe, your first win in Tucson, Arizona. Um, 30 years ago. T Tucson, Arizona, 30 years ago, 1992. So it took you a few years. What, tell us about those years and how you go from the tour and the grind to a win. Right. So there was a progression in college. Um, learn how to qualify to make the team to play events and then learn how to play in the events like I played in the qualifier. And then when you got in the hunt, you know, how to handle that sort of thing. So as a sophomore, I learned a lot. And then as a junior, I improved a lot. And Rocco Mediate got his card, got on tour, 
so here's a college mate of mine who got on tour. So I always wanted to be a pro, but now somebody I knew really well got through tour school, so I knew it could be done. So I couldn't wait for my senior year to be over so I could turn pro and give it a shot. Um, and three, you went to Q school. Right, and I went to Q school four times, uh, made it to the finals three times. There's a four-day cut at the finals. I made the four-day cut three times. I was right there twice, um, made two quadruple bogeys in round five at PGA West, and still, if I shot 70 left, I'd have made it. So I was that close, so I had to wait a whole nother year. That's the toughest part to swallow is, you know, you're on tour, you have a bad week, there's another week. A lot of people get used, over it right away. A lot of people used to say, Lee, that that was maybe one of the most grueling weeks that any tour player ever had to endure. Oh, it's awful. It's awful. Yeah, you don't sleep very well. I mean, it's hard to eat. You know, it's just because you, you, you know, it's if you don't make it, you got to wait a whole nother year, yeah. and and the whole thing is you got to get your game ready for that one week, no matter what you do the whole year. Right. You could go. Uh, I played on um, what was called the PGT and then the USGT and then later became the Hooters Tour. Uh -huh. And that's where I met Tom Lehman. Is it a good thing that they did away with Q School and now you go to the Corn Ferry Tour? Um, once the, yeah, what was called the Hogan Tour the first year, once that started, I thought that was the best way to get guys to graduate up to the tour. They play well all year long. They're the ones who deserve to get there. Got it. All right. So you win in 1992 in Tucson and then from there you had an unbelievable six years. But in 1998, after you won your second U.S. Open, you were only 34 years old at the Olympic Club. That's about right. It's about right. Um, I turned 34. I was 33 when I won. Okay. okay. Okay, that's right, because August. Right. So at the Olympic Club, you win your second U.S. Open. We'll get to that in a few minutes on these U.S. Open folks, but from 30, call it 34 years old nearly, all the way until you went to the Champions Tour. What was going on during those 16 years? Um, there w it wouldn't be just one factor, um, but if I could pick one factor, in 1999, the Monday between the Byron Nelson and the Colonial, I was going to get a haircut sitting at a light and got rear-ended. Whiplash, broke a bone in my neck and my back. Um, oh my. I just started seeing a physical therapist, so we flew her out and she had already, uh, evaluated my body so she knew everything that was wrong before I had the car accident so when she saw me she knew everything the car accident caused so we worked on it and I still played that week didn't feel right and I didn't even have any idea that I had broken two bones I wasn't in that kind of pain did that affect you for all those years um, it took a while to show up um, it was five or six years later when I started having a hard time turning my head how did um, that affect you mentally and it went down in my hand in oh my, did it really yeah through the left arm so it just took me a while to figure out how to tackle it properly. And once, you know, so it's been years since I've really had any problem with any of that. Right, but during those 16 years and, and no more wins on the PGA Tour, I know you won a couple, the Franklin Templeton and a, a couple others, but those were non-official events. That said, did that work on you, you know, emotionally, your confidence? I mean, how did you handle yeah, that? Yeah, um, I got myself in position quite often and then didn't play very well, you know. And that happens with golf, but you do it enough, um, it, it weighs on you a little bit. So, um, like I said, it wasn't just one factor. So uh, there was a lot of things I could have done differently to uh, not let those kind of things happen. Yeah. All right, let's talk. You won the Phoenix Open, by the way, so you won both the events in Arizona. You did win the Phoenix Open. And then you had some... You had some wonderful things happen to you between 93 and 98. In 1993, at Baldur's Row, you won the U.S. Open. You defeated Payne Stewart. In 98, you also won the U.S. Open at the Olympic Club, defeating Payne Stewart. Let's go to that 93 U.S. Open very quickly. They say that this is maybe one of the greatest shots in the history of the game. On number 16, when it absolutely had to happen, you had how far take me through that chip shot all right um well it was a hot week we had a lot of rain saturday night and it cooled off just a little bit for sunday it was like 92. Uh, so the course did play a little bit different and i can remember um whatever clubs we were hitting into 16 it, it seemed to play just a little bit longer uh pain hit i must have hit first because i birdied 14 part 15. i hit first and 
the, the hard part was to hit it over the bunker and have it stop short of the green. There was about four or five yards of rough, but it was downslope. Um, I think just maybe the rain softened the course just enough that it didn't kick onto the green. Did you like your lie? I had a great lie. Um, the pins well, depends on what seven or eight steps and I was three or four steps from the green So it, I had plenty of green to work with I had a perfect lie. There was no grass in between them. what club did you use? Um, it's just a regular sandwich. I wasn't using a lob wedge yet lob wedges really hadn't taken over the tour yet Yeah, 93, um, but it really was a simple chip um, so, I didn't like look at it and say well, this is easy I'm gonna chip it in but I knew that I could get it right next to the hole I think I read somewhere forgive me if I'm wrong correct me that you had kind of almost a premonition that you were going to make it. Did you feel like you were going to make that shot? Um, like I said, I just, I see the shot. I saw where I wanted to hit it and I saw the speed. Of course, I imagined it going in, but um, no, I just, I knew I just landed right there and it should work out. And, and then and eight, then for it to go in, you know, that's the bonus. Yeah. And pain was. And then he had a great putt that almost went in. Yeah. So now you go on to 17, then 18. You had to make a decision because you hit your drive in the rough, correct? Right. Tell me about that 18th hole Right. Um, from that shot in. There's water down the left, so I was steering clear of the water. Um, the hole is reachable in two, so even with a uh, two-shot lead playing the last hole, uh, Payne has enough length he can get to the green and make eagle. Um, so I knew that I would probably needed to make birdie at the worst, um, or you know that would secure things. So I drove it to the right in the rough. The rough um, was pretty manageable the whole week. Um, it was, I don't even know how long it was over to get over the water, but I'm looking at it and I have a four iron down there. No, maybe I had a seven iron down there. I had the four iron in on the third shot. And I would have had to hit it great to get it over the water. If I hit it in the water with that one, then over. now I'm in real trouble. And, and the story would be the guy that blew the US Open on the last hole. Right. Um, well, you didn't. Yeah, so you, I you, chipped it out in the fairway. And. And then you ended up winning the U.S. Open right. at Balta's role. And when we come back with Lee Jansen, we're going to talk about that other U.S. Open and his Ryder Cups in just a moment. We'll be back with more match play right after these messages. Introducing the newest addition to Zero Friction's performance arsenal. The Zero Friction Laser Pro Pistol Grip Rangefinder. The Laser Pro comes with a stable, pistol-shaped comfort grip that is lightweight with an easy-to-read scope. The device vibrates when you are zeroed in on your target and conforms with USGA and USGA handicap guidelines. Shoot on point without taking you out of the zone. Golf only exists because it's fun. What is special about golf is the relationships. Being out there with your family, your friends, so many different chances and opportunities are presented from the game of golf. Truman is brilliant. It's always first class experiences. Courses that they run, they want it to be a, as good as possible and it makes a big difference for the experience. Why wouldn't you select Truman? You're selecting the best of the best. You know the quality you're getting, you know the experience you're getting. There's nobody better. How many shots do you throw away from the sand, the rough, or even the fairway? What if there was a way you could own a great short game instantly? Introducing the all-new Alien Roswell Sand Wedge. The Alien Roswell's advanced design sole with the exclusive gravity rail system makes it nearly impossible for you to chunk it. I practice thousands and thousands of hours with my traditional sand wedge, but you don't have to with the Alien Roswell. Now you can try the instant automatic answer to solving your short game by going to aliengolf.com. Augusta Ranch Golf Club in Mesa has been voted the best executive course in Arizona. Challenging for all levels of players, it's family friendly and fun. Plus, it won't take you all day to play. There's an excellent practice range with PGA professionals to help you with your game and be sure to enjoy delicious food and beverages at the Scratch Pub and Grill. Make your next tee time at Augusta Ranch Golf Club by calling 480-354-1234 or by going to Augusta Ranch Golf. And now back to Match Play with your host, Ray Adams. All right, welcome back, folks. I'm with Lee Jansen again here at the Carolyn Golf Resort. 
And Lee, we were talking about the 93 U.S. Open. Now, in those years, you won eight times on the PGA Tour. So uh, you did have a great run there between 93 and 98. We've talked about that in the middle there. You had a Players' Championship. And the Players' Championship, was the players in those years what it has become now or is now just a much bigger, bigger, bigger event? What was it like then? Well, the purse is going to be twenty million this year, which is amazing for a golf tournament. But yes, it was the biggest purse on tour then. In 1995, it was a three million dollar purse. So how much did you win? Five hundred forty thousand. Five hundred forty thousand dollars, and today, what do they get? A couple million? I, I don't even know what they're getting with a twenty thousand dollar purse. That's, twenty million. That's going yeah. to be a lot. Yeah, it's going to be big. <laughs> All right, so Players Championship yeah. in there. Several other golf tournaments in there that you won, and then we get. And of course, we have Ryder Cups in there as well. So we know that you went to the Ryder Cup in 97, and uh, uh, you, you just, the Belfry was a win, um, Valderrama was a loss. We'll talk about that in a second. But let's get to 98 at the Olympic Club. Tell me about that U.S. Open briefly. Um, well, it was on the West Coast, California, San Francisco, um, and Westchester was a week before one of my favorite tournaments. And I always played the week before the U.S. Open, but this year I decided I wasn't going to do that because of the travel. Um, flying late Sunday night all the way to the West Coast, and there's always a chance you have weather delay, and then if you have to finish on Monday at Westchester, that gets you in later, and you'll have two days to prepare. So, yeah. I, And I think preparing for a U.S. Open course um, takes more than two days. Now, you'd already played the Olympic Club and right. were familiar with it, though. I played um, a tour championship there. Yeah. So a few years earlier. Um, so it was a course I could think about in my mind, you know, how to play the holes. But still, every hole is a side hill lie. And it, all the slopes seem to oppose. Um, left to right slope and the hole goes left. Uh, or the other way around, a right to left slope and the hole goes to the right. So you're always trying to work the ball back into the hill. So the week before uh, in Florida, I played golf at a different course every day and picked courses that had lots of dog legs just so I could work on curving the ball. Um, and I also put a three wood and a four wood in that I hadn't even used the whole year. Really? Just because they, they, I could hit them a little higher and curve them both a little bit more. So it was, I actually had a plan. So you it, went in with a plan, worked. you felt good, and it worked. Yeah. Now, in 93, you were well under par. But in 98, you won at even par and everybody else over par. Again, defeating Payne Stewart, he was one over. Was the course brutal that week? It was. Um, like I said, you know, it was very hard to hit the fairways because of the tilt. And then the rough was very brutal. Um, I, I think I had a few lies where I was fortunate enough to go at the green, um, you know, with a, maybe a 7 or 8 iron or even a 9 iron. Uh, but my stats that week, you know, I think I would led the tournament in fairways hit, and yeah. then I was second in green set. So yeah. it was a great ball striking week for me, and that's how you have to play Olympic club. You've got to really have control of your ball curving it left and right and controlling the distance. Two great U.S. Open uh, victories for Lee Jansen and Lee, your friend and the person that you were victorious over in both of your U.S. Opens, Payne Stewart, dies in that tragic, tragic plane incident. That affected you and brought a spiritual awakening, I read. Is that true? Right. Um, it, it was really... I know it was hard on Payne not to win at Olympic Club. He led the whole tournament. Yeah. Um, he he was so close in so many U.S. Opens. Um, when I was in college, he was one of my favorite players. Tom Watson first, then Payne Stewart. Um, so, you know, I, like all of Payne Stewart's fans, we all suffered every time he'd get close in the U.S. Open and not win. And then now, now I'm his competitor. Um, so I knew what it felt like to be that close and not win. And then to see him come back the next year and win, I thought, you know, he beat all these guys that were going to be number one in the world. One of the great U.S. Opens. Um, you know, and it's probably amplified a little bit because of what then happened a few months later, him being on a plane um, that ended his life. After his death, what happened to you inside? Right. Because um, you're, you're, you're a person who's a, a man of a Christian faith. You raised your family that way. And, but things changed inside of you. Tell us about that. Right. Well, we spent um, quite a bit of time at uh, the Stewart House right afterwards, and I met a lot of the people that were friends of his from church. Um, and because of that, we changed churches. I, you know, I said there's something different about these people. 
So I was very interested, um, and not, and then we also moved our son over to the First Academy, which is on the same campus as First yeah, Baptist. Yeah. Um, so that had a big impact right there. And then the funeral, um, virtually the whole tour showed up, and everybody was shaken, and it, it had a profound effect on a lot of people. Yeah. And I saw it, you know, and it didn't it wasn't just that day, but it was many days and weeks and months after that. It had an effect on a lot of people. Um, and just the question I would ask is. Um, is this going to be a short-term change or, or is it going to be a lasting change? Are people really going to have a difference in their lives going on forever? And what did you, what have you uh, noticed? I, so I, it was a challenge to me that, you know, am, am I, is this going to be a day where I, I'm now going this direction and that's it? I'm as far as your up. faith in your right. life. Right. So, um, you know, Paul talks about you being a baby as a Christian and you've got to mature. So I would say I was a baby in those days and I have matured constantly maturing. I have no idea where the full maturity level is. I don't think I'm very close, or that close, but I'm somewhere in between on the way. God's grace is revealed to me all the time. Um, the changes are happening in my life for the better. Yeah. I, I can't take credit for it all. You know, he, I'm very fortunate that he softened my heart in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, especially that grandbaby, too, helped us soften. We'll talk about that in just yeah. a quick second. Two Ryder Cups, the Belfry win, the Valderrama loss. Just give me a quick comment on Ryder Cupping and obviously the Americans and the Ryder Cup, kind of that that difficult way to get over the hump. We've done it a couple of times, but it was you know over many years, the Europeans are kind of in our head. Tell me about oh, that. Oh, yeah. The Europeans basically have dominated the event over the last 30 years. Um, we have not won on their soil since 1993. Why? Um, I think there's more than one factor. Um, one of the things the Europeans do is they usually play the Ryder Cup on a course that they play a regular tournament on. So they all have experience playing the course under tournament conditions. And, and we don't do that. Right. We go to one of the great old courses that we have about as much experience on as they do. Um, here we are in Phoenix. The TBC Phoenix, Scottsdale, would be an unbelievable Ryder Cup site. You know, it's amazing you say that because your great friend and who you're playing a match against, the Father's Day match, is... Tom Lehman, captain of the Ryder Cup, and I remember him telling me one time, hey, the TPC Scottsdale would be fantastic to have a Ryder Cup. All right, Lee Jansen, thanks so much for being with me on Match Play TV today. Great to be here. And you also, stay tuned right there. More episodes to come. important to start your day by getting your energy flowing and your body ready. That's great, but some days I need more. If you want to be great at something, it takes hard work and focus. Other times, I want more. There's nothing better than finding time to slow down for a meal with family and friends. Is there a chance of even more? It's absolutely amazing when you can sit around a fire to finish off the day. I'm so glad I found a place for all my mores. Quality products at a fair price.